Good morning. In today's headlines, a federal court deals a major blow to the Biden administration. Find out about the historic ruling yesterday that could change how government agencies can interact with big tech. Terror strikes the city of Tel Aviv. A Palestinian was shot dead after ramming pedestrians with a truck and then stabbing people. Meanwhile, Israel hits the Gaza Strip. A trade war between the U.S. and China over the future of semiconductors escalates. We speak to an expert to find out how the U.S. is positioned against the Chinese regime. The new Barbie movie is coming under fire. It contains a controversial map that one senator calls Chinese propaganda. Cities across the United States celebrated Independence Day yesterday. We take a look at events in the nation's capital and also the nation's birthplace. Have you ever wondered what your dreams mean? We spoke to a dream analyst who says understanding them can provide valuable insight into real life problems. Good morning. Welcome to NTD. I'm Kevin Hogan. Good morning, everyone. I'm Evelyn Lee. Today is Wednesday, July 5th, and we hope everyone had a great holiday. Yes, and we'll recap some of yesterday's grand celebrations as well as some unfortunate events. Stay tuned for that. But first, a major step in a federal censorship case yesterday. A judge blocked the Biden administration from pressuring big tech to censor or suppress social media posts. The historic ruling could change how government agencies interact with social media companies. NTD's Jeremy Sandberg tells us more. The partial injunction came in response to a censorship by proxy lawsuit brought by attorneys general in Louisiana and Missouri. They accused the Biden administration of pressuring social media companies to suspend accounts or take down posts to stop the spread of what the administration deemed disinformation. The lawsuit lists COVID-19, the origins of the pandemic, Hunter Biden's laptop, and election security as some of the topics that were policed. U.S. District Judge Terry A. Doughty, a Trump appointee, said the attorneys general showed evidence of massive censorship efforts coming from the Biden administration, but has yet to make a final decision. Doughty wrote the evidence produced so far depicts an almost dystopian scenario. Louisiana Attorney General Jeff Landry, one of the plaintiffs, says it's arguably one of the most important First Amendment cases in modern history. Landry told NTD what the next step will be. The further continuance of the litigation, we're going to ask for more discovery uh, on the plaintiffs. Look, a lot of the things that we were able to glean through the discovery and deposition process has given us the evidence necessary uh, for the judge to grant this particular order. It, that order was based upon, or the foundation of that order was based upon the evidence that we found in depositions and in the discovery of evidence and emails uh, throughout this process beginning last year. The preliminary injunction covers a range of government agencies, including the Justice Department, the DHS, the CDC, and CISA. The agencies are now prohibited from contacting tech companies in any way to pressure or encourage them to change their policies, take down posts, or suppress their reach. Landry says the order being handed out on Independence Day is extremely significant. The founders understood that without uh, the citizenry's ability to freely question and debate their government, then they were really not citizens, they were subjects. The judge made exceptions in his order for criminal activity or threats to national security. Contacts are also allowed to notify social media companies about posts intended to mislead voters about voting requirements or procedures. Landry expects the defendants to appeal the ruling and thinks the case will eventually be heard before the U.S. Supreme Court. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. A terror attack in Israel yesterday. A Palestinian terrorist rammed a pickup truck into pedestrians in Tel Aviv and then went on a stabbing rampage. NTD's Daniel Monahan has more on the attack and an update on Israel's counter-terror operation in the West Bank. The attack wounded eight people. At least five of them were in serious condition. One of the casualties was reportedly a pregnant woman. An armed civilian shot dead the 20-year-old Palestinian attacker from the West Bank. The attack was claimed by the Hamas terrorist group as retaliation for the Israeli operation in Jenin in the West Bank. Israeli forces withdrew from Jenin on Tuesday night. The Israeli operation in the city was launched with a drone strike on Monday. 
Over 1,000 troops were deployed. At least 13 Palestinians, five of them fighters, and one Israeli soldier were killed. Palestinian authorities say around 100 people were wounded by the fighting. It's not clear how many were terrorists and how many were civilians. Israeli officials maintain there were no civilian deaths from the operation. Meanwhile, Palestinian terrorists from the Gaza Strip fired rockets on Wednesday after the Israeli army withdrew from Jenin. The rockets were intercepted by Israel's air defense system. Israeli jets returned fire, hitting a Hamas underground weapons manufacturing facility. It was not immediately clear whether there would be any further escalation. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. The trade war between the U.S. and China is escalating. The Chinese Communist Party announced export controls on two strategic raw materials on Monday. The, met the metals are gallium and germanium. Both are critical to microchip makers globally. They are also used in solar panels and electric vehicles. Here's what retired Colonel John Mills told NTD yesterday about the trade war. The lack of access to these basic uh, key uh, rare earth metals, this is foundational to uh, a, a modern economy. And this is the price of globalism as we have given away both extraction and processing of these critical materials. This is what happens. Now we're vulnerable. Now we're having to negotiate with China. The move to restrict exports of the metals come as U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen prepares to visit China. Yellen leaves for Beijing tomorrow and is set to return Sunday. She is the second top U.S. official to visit China in the last month. China's announcement is widely seen as retaliation to the U.S. banning exports of AI microchips to China. Some call it a tit-for-tat move. And joining us now to break down where this positions the U.S. against the Chinese regime is Anders Kaur. He's the publisher of the Journal of Political Risk. Good morning, Anders. China, morning. China hasn't retaliated much to the restrictions imposed by the U.S. in the past. So what does the timing now tell you? Well, it's undeniable that Yellen is about to visit uh, China. Um, there will be a lot of things on the table now. Beijing has an additional issue that they can, additional bargaining chip that they can use uh, in these negotiations. So in terms of bargaining, can you give us an idea first of how big of a role the materials actually play for the U.S.? Well, Yellen will be able to counter uh, any kind of attempt to use these minerals as bargaining chips with the fact that we can potentially get them elsewhere. I mean, Australia, uh, the United States has some resources. Uh, the only problem with this is that uh, it'll take, it may take years, a couple of years uh, to spin up the refineries necessary to get those things into production uh, and into our own supply chains. Well, and analysts with the Eurasia Group have said that, you know, China wants to remind other countries of the retali retaliatory options it has. So how should countries like Japan and the Netherlands, for instance, assess the risk? Well, all of these countries are now, will be switching their supply chains for these minerals to other places. I mean, they can't, if they can't rely on China to provide it, which they should have known already, um, then they're going to, it's just going to accelerate the uh, decoupling and de-risking process. Mm. And what about, but how will this affect our economy in the short term then? Well, it could make chips, computer chips, more costly in the short term. Um, in the long term, it's going to diversify our supply chains. Hmm. And how will it affect Chinese economy? Because they're losing that chunk of revenue as well. Yeah, I, their, their economy is already in the doldrums. So for the past three months, the manufacturing index has, has actually gone down. Um, and uh, so they're having serious economic problems. This isn't going to help. Uh, countries are already moving to India, Vietnam, um, and elsewhere in order to escape this problem that China is creating, that the Chinese Communist Party is creating. So just to give us a bottom line here, where does this position the U.S. against China then in this, you know, chip war, if you will, in the negotiations as well when Yellen is going to China? The chip war is really 
a, it's a it's a sideshow in a way. It's central, but it's also a sideshow in that um, there is a developing Cold War between the United States and China. When we had a Cold War with the Soviet Union, uh, trade really ground to a halt with that country, um, and I think we're going to see a gradual uh, the same sort of thing happen with China over time, and it's it's already happening. I mean, decoupling, de-risking. Um, your, you know, Europe, the United States, Japan, India, all of these countries, I think, will gradually decouple from China because of what they're doing. I mean, the stuff that they're doing is so ludicrous. The most recently, uh, Wang Yi has made these crazy statements about a China, uh, Japan, South Korea alliance based on race. It just makes no sense. Mm. Well, thank you so much, Andes Kaur. I appreciate your insights today. Thank you. And Senator Ted Cruz is bashing the upcoming Barbie movie for including what he calls Chinese propaganda. The movie is under fire over a controversial map showing the Chinese regime's territorial claims. Here are the details. Senator Ted Cruz retweeted an article on Sunday about Vietnam banning the upcoming Warner Brothers Barbie movie saying, quote, I guess Barbie is made in China. Vietnam state media first reported that the country's film censors banned the Barbie movie because it includes a map that shows the Chinese regime's territorial claims. A scene in the film allegedly shows the Chinese regime's so-called Nine Dash Line, which depicts most of the South China Sea as part of the Chinese territory. Countries in the region include Vietnam, the Philippines, Malaysia, and Taiwan all contest China's claims. An international court in 2016 ruled that China's claims in the region were invalid. Vietnam has repeatedly accused Chinese vessels of violating its sovereignty, and disputes between the two countries' militaries often happen in the area. The Vietnamese government blocked the DreamWorks cartoon, Abominable, in 2019, and Sony's action movie, Uncharted, last year for the same issue with maps showing the Nine Dash Line. Concerns are rising over what some call Hollywood's pandering to the Chinese film market, which is now the world's biggest. Cruz's office told the Daily Mail, quote, China wants to control what Americans see, hear, and ultimately think and they leverage their massive film markets to coerce American companies into pushing Chinese Communist Party propaganda, just like the way the Barbie film seems to have done with the map. Reporting by Allison Lee, NTD News. Still to come, we take a look at Independence Day celebrations in the city of brotherly love and the nation's capital. And some more news from the 4th of July. Two shark bites were reported off beaches in Long Island. More on that after the break. Welcome back. What is July 4th without fireworks? Uh, you know, in a history lesson here, Evelyn, the tradition actually started in 1777 on July 4th. And then the next day, the newspaper said it was a celebration of joy and festivities. Oh, yeah. So not much, really. In D.C., <laughs> thousands of people gathered on the National Mall for a spectacular fireworks show to celebrate Independence Day. The fireworks were launched from both sides of the reflecting pool at the Lincoln Memorial and lasted for about 17 minutes. And New York City celebrated Independence Day with the Macy's annual 4th of July fireworks show. It launched some 60,000 pyrotechnics into the sky, bursting in bouquets of colorful light over New York City's East River. And at the end, visitors were treated to a drone show. That's pretty cool. Yeah, drones are a little safer than fireworks. Oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, and, but before all of that, heavy downpours earlier interrupted the Nathan's Famous 4th of July hot dog eating contest in the city. But the weather cleared up in time for the Macy's fireworks show. Yep, the weather didn't stop people from coming out for the grand celebration. Yeah, cities across the United States celebrated Independence Day yesterday, and that includes Philadelphia, the birthplace of the Declaration of Independence. Here's more. Thank you. People gathered at Philadelphia's Independence Hall on Tuesday for the annual 4th of July celebration. The ceremony at the birth city of American independence included a reading of the Declaration of Independence, speeches by lawmakers, and a parade. 
I'm so excited. It is Independence Day, July 4th here in America, celebrating our independence from Great Britain. Um, and it's just a great day full of celebration and excitedness and happiness. NTD was at the celebration to ask people what Independence Day means to them. Well, as a former U.S. history teacher and um, serving in the military, this is our country and this is history. So it's, it's great to be in Philadelphia, um, seeing where all of our country was founded and the historical Independence Hall being here and just enjoying this opportunity to share this with other people. Philadelphia City Councilman Mark Squilla said it's an honor for him to represent the historic district in Philadelphia. What it means to the country, knowing that the Declaration of Independence was written right here in Philadelphia, right, right next to us where we are today, and how important democracy, liberty, freedom, and justice is to all the people of this country. And to be able to found it here, to be a part of the city of Philadelphia, it's just an honor to be able to celebrate that today with all the people here in the city of Philadelphia. Dan Bartow, a volunteer at Independence National Historical Park, explains what he tells his kids about the 4th of July. There is a lot of celebration, there's a lot of fireworks, uh, we have parades, but I also think it's important to, to think about how hard it was to achieve independence. And I talk to them about, well, you know, it, you know to break away from the largest uh, uh, country in the world to become an independent nation took a lot of bravery, took a lot of courage, and it took a lot of... Uh, really uh, persistent, so I, I try to explain to them it wasn't all fireworks and parades, it was, uh, it was a difficult decision. Lauren Kobillers is the executive director at Students Run Philly Style, a nonprofit that engages middle school and high school students through long distance running. She is the winner of the Wawa Foundation Hero Award, which was presented at the ceremony. I think for us, um, July 4th, obviously, it's, it's the birthplace of our nation, and we have continued to be part of our store, part of that story. And so our young people, every person has an individual story, and so it's nice to be part of a community and a larger celebration today. The Salute to America Independence Day Parade ended at Philadelphia City Hall and featured patriotic floats, marching bands, military units, and historic characters. You know, Evelyn, there's just so much history in Philadelphia. It, there is. Yeah, I remember going there and seeing the Liberty Bell, which was really cool. Oh yeah, I saw that one too. Yeah, <laughs> and then the statue of the signer. <laughs> Where did you pull? Is that a prop? <laughs> wow. A little risky to have your name on that document. Oh, the for Brits sure, find yeah. out. <laughs> but yeah, what a great place to visit, especially when you know what has, like, all the history that is there. Yeah, first place. And that was not the only celebration. Of course, in Washington, D.C., NTD's Melina Weisskub joined the celebrations in the Capitol to find out why and how Americans honor Independence Day. We're here in the heart of the nation where once again hundreds of thousands of people have gathered to celebrate the 4th of July. The environment is very lively. Of course, the bands always bring the environment to life. Let's talk to some of the audience members to find out why it's important for them to celebrate this holiday. Especially in times like today, days like that are very important to keep traditions alive. You know, a lot of people, they give their lives and they dedicated themselves to have this independence. So it's a memorable day for throughout the United States. On this day, roughly two and a half centuries ago, the Founding Fathers outlined ideals of humanity. And to make those ideals a reality, gathered in Philadelphia to sign the Declaration of Independence. Those celebrating today tell NTD that for them, one of the most fundamental American values is that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And because of the United States, it was able to make it so we could strive. Without freedom of religion, we wouldn't be here today. And I don't think a lot of American beliefs would be here today either. Americans believe in the freedom of speech and freedom of religion. Uh, we are all Falun Dafa practitioners. However, unfortunately, uh, Falun Dafa has been persecuted in China since 1999, and thousands of practitioners have lost their lives. They were unable to practice truthfulness, compassion, and tolerance in China. We, however, as practitioners here in this democratic, free society, are able to do that. And today, those values are brought to life through giant floats, rhythmic bands, and dressed-up characters. What do you like the most? Probably the bands. Do you like the music or the dancer? All of them. You know, there's nothing you don't like? I like fireworks and stuff. Okay, you guys going to go watch fireworks tonight? Yes. 
As is tradition, the National Mall lawn will be filled with people and expected 100,000 to watch the grand finale, fireworks. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskopf, NTD News. And at this point, we're taking a bit of a turn here because we have some disturbing breaking news out of Washington, D.C. A shooting early this morning left nine people injured. Police say it happened as the victims were celebrating the 4th of July around 1 a.m. The shots were fired from a dark colored SUV. Police say it happened just blocks from the Maryland state line, roughly five miles from the U.S. Capitol. Here's more from the police on the shooting. All of our victims have non-life-threatening injuries. We do have a total of nine victims. Two of our victims are juveniles, one being nine years old, one being 17 years old. The assistant chief did not say if all nine of the injured suffered gunshot wounds. Police are asking the public for any information, photos or videos that can help them find the suspects. And in Texas, three people were killed and eight others injured in a shooting after an Independence Day celebration just before midnight on Monday. The shooting took place about two hours after a gathering called Como Fest ended. Several men fired indiscriminately into a crowd of hundreds several blocks away from the area where the celebration was held. Police say the shooting was separate from and unrelated to the festival. No arrests have been made or suspects identified. In New York, two shark bites were reported at Long Island yesterday. That makes three reports in just two days. Yesterday, a man in the water off Quag Village Beach in the Hamptons felt a bite to his knee. After that, a reported bite at Fire Island Pines Beach, where a teen surfer's foot was bitten just a day before. Prior to the July 4th reports, lifeguards used drones to survey the water at Robert Moses State Park on Long Island. They spotted a school of sand sharks, causing them to shut down the beach for an hour and a half. Last year, New York recorded eight people with shark bites. Governor Kathy Hochul announced in May the purchase of new shark spotting drones in response to the increase in shark bites. New York's Department of Environmental Conservation has some tips to avoid sharks while swimming. Those tips include avoiding areas with schools of fish, splashing fish, seals and diving seabirds. The department also advises against swimming at dusk, nighttime or dawn and recommends avoiding murky water. It also recommends swimming, paddling and surfing with groups of people and suggests staying close to shore where your feet can touch the bottom. Another tragic animal attack, this time an alligator killed a 69-year-old woman in South Carolina. The Beaufort County Sheriff's Office reported yesterday the woman was found unresponsive at the edge of a lagoon. Rescue efforts were interrupted by an alligator that appeared to be guarding the woman's body. The alligator was removed from the area and the woman's corpse was recovered. The sheriff's office said the woman was walking her dog yesterday morning when the attack occurred. This is the second fatal alligator attack in Beaufort County in less than a year. And stay tuned, a nuclear power plant in Ukraine is in the spotlight. Ukraine and Russia both accuse each other of planning to attack it in a high stakes game. And a major drug bust in Mexico. The country's Navy seized over two and a half tons of cocaine on Monday. We'll have the details when we return. What does it mean to devote your life to the truth? Does it mean investigating communist subversion here in America? Does it mean exposing the deadly fentanyl crisis in the Midwest? We're spending late nights and covering deep government corruption because at a time when America's traditional values are under attack, it's the responsibility of righteous journalists to uphold truth and tradition. The stories that need to be told, the voices that need to be heard, the truth that you need to see. Get unbiased and in-depth news. Don't miss a beat. I'm Stephanie Cox. At NTD, we're here for you. What is China like really? Is it defined by its giant economy, an oppressive government, or its people? By the worst persecutors or the most courageous freedom fighters? We're lifting the veil to look at global impacts and how close the regime is to your doorstep. From eyewitnesses and analysts, get the facts here on China in Focus.
Welcome back. Possible movement in the case of detained Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich. Russia said on Tuesday it's been in contact with the U.S. over the case, but wanted to keep things out of the public eye. The Kremlin made the remark a day after Ambassador Lynn Tracy was allowed to visit Gershkovich in a Moscow prison. Hours later, the Russian embassy said its staff visited Vladimir Dunov. He is a Russian national who was in pretrial detention in Ohio on cybercrime charges. Russia accuses Gershkovich of espionage, which he denies. Russia previously said there could be no exchange involving Gershkovich until a verdict is reached in his case. No date has so far been announced for his trial. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said Tuesday that Russia is planning an attack on the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Ukrainian forces say explosive devices have been placed on the roof of the station's third and fourth reactors. Meanwhile, a Russian official accuses Ukraine of plant to, to drop ammunition laced with nuclear waste on the plant. The power station has long been the subject of mutual accusations and suspicions. Russian troops seized the plant in the days following the Kremlin's invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. Each side has regularly accused the other of shelling around the plant and risking a major nuclear mishap. In Mexico, a major drug bust. The country's Navy seized over two and a half tons of cocaine on Monday. It was seized from three speedboats on the coast of Guerrero, a state in southwest Mexico. Aerial surveillance footage shows people getting off the boats and running towards the mainland. The bust occurred after the Mexican Navy tracked one of the boats for seven hours. The Navy says that the crew members fled after becoming aware of the operation against them. The bust follows last week's seizure of over three and a half tons of cocaine from a so-called narco submarine. And now getting to some short headlines from around the world. Severe flooding in China killed at least 15 people over the last few days. Four others are missing. Video footage shows some buildings partially submerged. Heavy rains in southwest China have disrupted the lives of more than 130,000 people. Close to 20,000 acres of crops were damaged. Sixteen children were rescued from child abuse in the Philippines in a historic raid at the end of June. That's according to a joint statement from the Australian Federal Police, the Australian Border Force and the Philippine National Police. Switzerland says it plans to take part in a Europe-wide air defense project. The project was started in response to Russia's attack on Ukraine. The Alpine country is the second neutral nation after Austria to signal its intention to join the European Sky Shield initiative launched by Germany last year. And coming up, another roller coaster nightmare you don't want to be in. Ooh. And a stranded hiker is saved by her iPhone? Learn how a woman with a broken ankle and no cell service managed to get help with one of Apple's new features. And a supplement that's being hyped on social media for weight loss doesn't really work. Good to have you back with us. A Florida man and a dozen illegal immigrants are in custody after a chase in Texas involving a big rig. Monday, the Texas Department of Public Safety posted this video of the high-speed pursuit in LaSalle County. DPS reports Eduardo Aradas was behind the wheel of the truck last Tuesday when authorities tried to pull him over on Highway 35 for a traffic violation. According to officials, Aradas refused to stop and instead picked up speed. DPS pursued the vehicle, noting speeds reached 85 miles per hour at one point, and the truck started traveling on the wrong side of the highway. Eventually, they say the truck went off the road, and the driver, as well as several migrants, bailed out. Aradas was apprehended, along with 12 illegal immigrants. He now faces state criminal charges for smuggling and evading. The DPS says the migrants' cases have been referred to U.S. Border Patrol. And meanwhile, four migrants, including an infant, drowned in the Rio Grande River in a 48-hour span. According to a tweet from authorities, a woman and an infant were found unresponsive and later pronounced dead at a hospital. A day later, a man's body was found in the river, and in a separate incident, a woman's body was also found on Monday. 
The identities of the deceased are unknown at this time. Authorities say none of them were carrying identification. Mexican authorities made another arrest in the deadly kidnapping of four Americans in Matamoros, Mexico, early this year. That makes a total of at least seven people who have now been arrested in the case. Latavia Washington McGee and Eric Williams survived the kidnapping, while Shaid Woodard and Zindel Brown were killed. The tight-knit group had traveled from South Carolina to Matamoros for Washington McGee to undergo a medical procedure, but they were attacked by gunmen who fired into their van, then loaded them in the back of a truck and took them away. The victims were shuttled to multiple locations before they were found in a house near Matamoros. Another roller coaster nightmare, this time at Wisconsin's Forest County Festival theme park. A roller coaster malfunctioned over the weekend, leaving eight passengers suspended upside down for hours. Local authority says a mechanical failure caused the ride to become stuck in the upright position. Videos captured the moment rescuers climbed up the side of the ride while passengers anxiously awaited while stuck in the middle of the track's loop section. Due to the ride's height, specialized equipment and additional rescue teams were summoned. Firefighters from three cities joined forces to orchestrate the rescue mission. Nearly two hours after emergency crews were dispatched, the first passenger was safely brought back to ground. And after three hours, the last passenger was successfully rescued. It was not immediately clear what caused the issue. Local authorities said the ride had been recently inspected on site by the state of Wisconsin. Ooh, you definitely don't want to be on that ride. No, some intense situations. Ten fire vehicles, nine ambulances, and a total of 50 personnel from three counties came to the rescue. And this just days after a concerned father discovered a crack in a steel support pillar atop a roller coaster in North Carolina. Yeah, and maybe it makes people think twice before going on a roller coaster. And here's another situation you don't want to be in, and that's being lost in the wild without any phone service. Oh, no. Yeah, a stranded hiker saved by an iPhone. A new iPhone feature let the woman contact the police, even though she was in an area with no cell service. We explained the feature, which could come in very handy on future hikes. NTD's Colin Fredrickson has more for us. A new iPhone feature has rescued a stranded injured hiker in the middle of the Los Angeles National Forest. Juana Reyes and her friends were hiking through rough terrain in an area where there was no cell phone service. Reyes then proceeded to break her ankle, making the journey home considerably more difficult. But then Reyes remembered. Emergency SOS via satellite allows you to connect to satellites when cell service or Wi-Fi are unavailable. You answer basic questions about your emergency. Live, on-screen directions will then guide you to connect to a nearby satellite. The feature is called Emergency SOS via Satellite. Apple first announced the feature during the iPhone 14 keynote. The service just launched last November. By using the feature, Reyes was able to contact the Los Angeles County Sheriff's search and rescue team. The team then found Reyes and carried her off to safety. If you want to use Emergency SOS via satellite yourself, first you need an iPhone 14. You can simply call 911 or hit the emergency text via satellite button. Be sure to hold the phone naturally in your hand. Be outside with a clear view of the sky and follow the on-screen guidance to stay connected to a satellite. Colin Fredrickson, NTD News. Really good to know it has these features. Yeah, technology can really come in handy. Make sure you bring your cell phones when you go out for a hike. Yeah, but remember, it's only iPhone 14 at this point, right? Mm. Anyway, what is this new viral supplement that's on social media these days? Users are swearing by it for weight loss. Berberine has made headlines recently, but is it actually working and is it healthy? I spoke to Barton Scott. He's the founder and chief science officer for Upgraded Formulas because it, it helps you balance your blood sugar. So whenever you eat something that's either sugary or high in carbs, <clears throat> your glycemic index is, I mean, it's just very high, right? So there's a relationship between insulin in the body and blood sugar. So when these two things are in line and they there's enough bandwidth, then you don't store a fat, which is how it helps with weight loss. There's other things that really help as well, though, uh, that are even more foundational. 
which are elements, uh, which is what we do. And I, I put together a product years ago called Upgraded Metabolism that does basically the same thing. And you can take with berberine, which is a great option. If you really want to be serious of being healthy to lose the weight, instead of trying to just lose the weight to be healthy, or just trying to lose the weight and not really caring if you're healthy deep down, uh, which kind of blows my mind, but that's, that's a lot of people's approach. The thing is, is berberine shouldn't be taken every single day. Uh, now, is it safer than nearly all drugs out there? Yes, there's a lot of research on it. So a lot of research on what I'm talking about as well, the elements, um, because these things support a number of processes in the body. You're talking manganese, chromium, but actually absorbing the minerals is what I figured out how to improve so the body can absorb them without requiring digestion. Now, when you say it's not supposed to be uh, taken every day, how, what is the recommended dosage for, for berberine? Yeah, so every other day would be fine. Not every meal, uh, four out of seven days. These, this, in a way that your body isn't adapting to it. Now, I counterbalance that with what I was saying earlier with, with minerals, because this is the periodic table in action. So we're all made of the periodic table. I think we can agree, anyone that passed like ninth grade science can agree on that. The problem is, is most often we're not testing for what, we're, what we are currently and what we're missing. Um, so that we do that through hair testing, which we offer. And then things can be layered on top of that, like berberine. It's not ever going to be a foundational thing and it shouldn't be done every day. I see. So not foundational. What should be um, the priority when it comes to losing weight then? Is there a different, what is your, what would be your recommendation as of approach? My, what I've seen work really well is when we focus on getting healthy first and then weight loss happens as a result. Instead of going, this is the focus, going, this is the focus. And as I feel better, I have more energy, I move more during the day, I'm less sedentary, I go for the walk, I have the energy to wake up and go to the gym. All of these things, right? Uh, like, you know, here in Florida, I just got back from a beach run. So all of these things are really not possible if you don't have the energy. Berberine won't help you with that, but it will help with your blood sugar balancing, which is very important, very, very important. But so will these minerals that are in this blend called upgraded metabolism. Uh, and we have other products as well. But first, what I really recommend is knowing your numbers. Just like in business, if you don't know your numbers, you know, you just drive head, head first into a wall. So you, with knowing your numbers in health, with having a hair test and then a consultation, all of this can be done from the comfort of your home. And then knowing the products you need to take, the foods you need to eat more of, and the things you're actually high in, for example, calcium, maybe high. We see a lot of people that are very high in calcium and they think calcium is something they should be supplementing. In almost no case today, based on empirical evidence that we've seen for years now, we've had the company for seven years, it's very, very rare for us to need to give someone calcium, which do we have that as a supplement? Sure, but is it often recommended? No. Um, so hopefully that, that process that arcing process makes sense. That's really good to know. So thank you so much, Bart and Scott. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. And things can get messy at the annual Traditions of Food Eating contests. Find out the winners of some big events yesterday, right after the break. Good to have you back. Now, we've got something interesting for you. Have you ever had dreams that were so real that you thought, wow, is this trying to tell me something? Wow, you know, actually, sometimes my dreams do make me think, but other times they're just so irrelevant. I don't read too much into them. But you do pose an interesting question. I'm curious. Tell me more. Oh, yeah, because everyone has experienced dreams and nightmares, and I'm sure people wonder sometimes, like, you know, is the subconscious trying to send me a message? Well, it turns out dreams are not as bizarre and random as we might think. Entity's Andrew Thomas reports. What's happening in the brain as we dream? Dream analyst Lori Lowenberg explains that the brainstem releases a chemical that paralyzes the skeletal muscles so we don't act out our dreams. 
the part of the prefrontal cortex that controls rational and linear thought remains largely dormant, which is why our dreams can seem strange or random, while the amygdala, the emotional center of the brain, is active. They are symbolic. It, it is a thinking process. We're still thinking um, when we're dreaming, but rather than thinking literally, we're thinking in symbols, metaphors, and emotions. Lowenberg also explains another reason for dreaming. She cites cave drawings in France. So it's believed that back then in the very early stages of humanity, dreaming served the purpose of survival. Um, you know, dreaming of being chased would help us learn to escape predators. Common nightmares include death or the death of a loved one. Lowenberg says these kinds of dreams are metaphors for life and relationship changes or endings. Drowning is another familiar nightmare. According to Lowenberg, drowning dreams indicate being overwhelmed or in over our head in real life. They're actually the most important dreams of all because they're alerting you to something that's wrong in your life that your psyche, that your subconscious wants you to correct. And they're so upsetting and difficult to experience because they're connected to an upsetting or difficult real life issue. Other common dreams include being chased, which represent running away from or avoiding a real life problem. Dreaming about teeth falling out points to real world communication issues. All are important to keep track of, says Lowenberg. Most important, what is most crucial is that you need to start journaling your dreams along with journaling what goes on in your day. So I recommend getting a spiral bound notebook so that you keep your day on one side and your dreams on the other. Lowenberg says analyzing and understanding our dreams and nightmares allow us to be brutally honest with ourselves. You're going to get a huge edge in life because you're going to understand yourself, your relationships, um, your faults, your strengths, everything around you on a much deeper, much wiser level. That brutal honesty may give us the opportunity to make significant positive life changes. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. That was really interesting. Have you ever had a lucid dream before? Well, all the time when I was little, but honestly, I haven't. I wonder what that means, too. I haven't had any dreams in like a decade. Well, I'm sure I dream, but I just don't remember them at all. Okay, yeah. Well, you know, like she was mentioning, if you write a dream journal, it can actually help you get into that lucid state. No. Oh. Maybe I'll try that when I actually remember them again. <laughs> yeah, and when you have time, right? <laughs> yeah, and now for some delicious news, at least for those with a sweet tooth, dozens of competitors gathered in Key West, Florida yesterday to get messy for the city's key lime pie eating contest. The July 4th competition is the culmination of Key West's annual key lime festival. Let's take a look. Dozens of competitors plunged face down into the pies with just one motto, eat as fast as you can. The contest's rules are simple. Competitors are required to eat the pie face first and without the use of their hands. This year's winner was Joshua Mogul from Iowa, who completed the challenge in around three and a half minutes. My strategy today was just to don't breathe and just keep eating, constantly bringing food in the mouth, just eat, eat, eat. The key lime pie is said to have originated in Key West in the late 19th century. Its primary ingredients are condensed milk, egg yolks and the juice of tiny yellow key limes, typically with a graham cracker crust and whipped cream or meringue topping. It was designated Florida's official pie in 2006. Costa Menes, NTD News. That guy had a really smart strategy. What was it? Just. Don't breathe, just oh, eat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no way, time wasted. Sometimes after work, I kind of like that. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, sure, whatever when works. You're hungry. <laughs> Delivering news, it's a lot of psycho calories, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, never thought of it like that, but you're right. The annual competition has become Florida's substitute to Nathan's famous 4th of July hot dog eating contest. Yes, this year's competition was hampered by stormy and rainy weather in New York, which caused a delay of two hours. But nothing stops them con to continue this tradition. This year's winner was no surprise. Joey Chestnut has won the title 16 times in 17 years. This year, downing a whopping 62 hot dogs with buns in 10 minutes. A distant second place came in at 49 hot dogs. Oh, wow, that is an insane amount of hot dogs. But apparently, 
it's not his best effort. Chestnut's record in the competition is an unbelievable 76 hot dogs. Just, just think about that for a minute. He's only lost one competition overall. In 2015, he lost by a very narrow margin of just two hot dogs. And in the women's contest, Mickey Sudo ate 39 and a half hot dogs, winning her ninth title. Sudo said she was quite disappointed despite winning after consuming nine hot dogs less than her all-time high. She said she was thrown off by the competition from second place winner Mayoi Ebihara from Japan. Man. Oh, wow. And we were just talking about that yesterday, right? Pie versus hot dogs? Oh, yeah, we were. Yeah. Our <laughs> viewers remember that? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I love, I love hot dog still. And I think it's not just, it look, doesn't just look easier to eat and less messy, but I think it's just so much more delicious. Yeah, and we do recommend chewing your food and then eating, you know, just enough till Yeah, don't choke. Full. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's all for today's program. We'd love to hear from you at goodmorning at ntd.com. Shoot us an email if you'd like. Thanks for watching. I'm Evelyn Lee. And I'm Kevin Hogan.